So le let me uh, present in, in, in a nutshell what I think the design failures are of the Eurozone, and then I will elaborate a little bit on this, and then in the second part I will talk about how to correct for these design failures. So first of all, what I see as, as a design failure has to do with the following. Capitalism is um, a fantastic invention, but it's also very unstable, producing booms and busts, bubbles and crashes all the time. This has been for centuries like that, right? And these booms and busts have been there, and when those who designed the, the Eurozone thought that they would be transformed into booms and busts at the Eurozone level. But no, they remained there, but at a national level. You had a boom and bust in Ireland and none in Germany. Um, and so all this remained at a national level, creating potential for huge divergences and imbalances, to which I will come back and that you know quite well, right? So that was, in a way, something that escaped the attention of those who created this, thinking that if you, if you bring money together, then you will have the same cycle. And we didn't have the same cycle. In fact, some people have argued that by the very fact that you are a monetary union, you might even have exacerbated these national booms and busts rather than making them more convergent. So that's one. The other one has to do with the following. Over the, the, the centuries, we have introduced stabilizers in this capitalistic system, right? But they were organized at the national level. And when we created the Eurozone, these stabilizers at the national level were dismantled and nothing was put into place at the Eurozone level. So that essentially some key stabilizers did not function. I will elaborate on this. Right. So let's first say a few things about these booms and bust dynamics that have remained national. Right. What we did in the Eurozone was to centralize money fully, but most of the rest of macroeconomic policies remained organized at the national level, creating this potential for national booms and busts to continue to, to do their work, right? unhindered by the fact that there was a monetary union. The monetary union, in other words, was no disciplining, disciplining force in terms of these booms and bursts, and, and, and it did not at all bring them together into a Eurozone one. That would, of course, that was in fact the intention, because we know from the literature on optical currency areas that the problem of um, monetary unions is asymmetric developments, asymmetric shocks, and they continue to work unhindered. In fact, as I said, uh, one can make the argument that the, 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 the existence of a monetary union exacerbated this because, as you know, the ECB had to put an interest rate that would prevail for everybody, and therefore it was way too low for Ireland right, and too high for Germany, and as a result exacerbating the boom in Ireland and in other booming countries and, 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 and making the boom and later on the bust, more intense. Right? So that is, I think, a, a major problem, a design failure in a way that has very much to do also with the fact that um, we, we left the whole of the Eurozone um, an unfinished business, right? We centralized money, but it's so little in terms of centralizing other parts of macroeconomic policies, right? That's what was left out of the agenda. We are now trying to, to do that, um, but uh, certainly too late to have avoided the, the, the crisis. Here yeah, I show you the, the, the difference in inflation uh, <clears throat> uh, over the period prior to the crisis. This, this is probably something you have seen. Here you have Ireland, Spain, Greece, where the average inflation rate um, over the, a period of eight years prior to the crisis was significantly higher than the other countries like Germany. That's the vertical axis, the horizontal axis, the unit labor cost that also tended to increase much faster in the booming countries, creating then the imbalances that we know, current account imbalances, um, the surplus countries um, increased their current account surpluses up to the crisis, while 
the, the, the booming countries and the deficit countries then increased their current account deficits as the boom, the consumption boom, led to um, increasing current account deficits. So this, this is the story that, that we know that has been very much uh, emphasized as a, as a design uh, problem of the Eurozone. But let me concentrate on, on the other one that I think is equally important, if not more so, and has for a long time been totally um, unrecognized by um, those who created and then later on run the Eurozone. Prior to um, the existence of the Eurozone, each country had its own central bank, and as a result also a lender of last resort um, to, um, to provide liquidity in times of crisis. And um, this means that prior to the crisis, um, these governments had a backstop that they lost at the moment they entered the monetary union. Let me elaborate a little bit on this, and, and this will then put um, at center stage the, the fragility of the government bond market in the monetary union. Governments in the monetary union, when they issue debt, have to do it in, a foreign, it, in what de facto is a foreign currency, and as a result cannot give a guarantee to the bondholders that they will be paid out at maturity. Um, it's literally possible that um, member countries of the Eurozone find themselves in a situation where they have no cash to pay out bondholders. That contrasts a great deal with standalone countries, and all these member countries of the Eurozone used to be standalone countries, that give an implicit guarantee to bondholders, which is that they will always be paid out at maturity, because there is a central bank that will be forced to do so in times of crisis. No sovereign will allow to be pushed into bankruptcy by the markets if it can avoid it by telling the central bank, produce the cash so that I can pay out the bondholders. Right? And as a result, a standalone country can provide a guarantee to bondholders that they will, pay that, will be paid out at maturity, while member countries of a monetary union cannot give the guarantee to bondholders that this will always be the case. And that creates a huge fragility um, of, of a monetary union. It also produces a potential for self-fulfilling crisis. Right? Uh, here is the scenario that will occur when, um, at a certain moment, bondholders um, are fearful, they, 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 they see some of the numbers that don't look right, and they sell government bonds, interest rates increase, but more importantly, liquidity is withdrawn from the national markets. When the bondholders sell Irish bonds, um, the, the euros they obtain will be invested elsewhere and are drained out of the Irish money market, and the government finds itself unable to roll over its debt. No liquidity is available, right? And it cannot call the central bank, right? If the governor of the Irish Central Bank calls Draghi. Draghi will not take up the telephone. Um, and as a result, um, in a panic, the government has to introduce immediate and intense austerity because there's no cash. What do you do when you have no cash? You have to immediately cut spending, raise taxes, uh, producing deep recessions and increases in the debt to GDP ratio. That in turn can lead to a default crisis. So here we have um, scenarios that we have seen all the time, countries that I think are solvent, I, I think, for example, that Ireland is a solvent nation, pushed into a liquidity crisis that can degenerate into a solvency crisis because the, the country is pushed in su such austerity that the capacity to service the debt declines, the debt to GDP ratio increases, and as a result, the capacity to service the debt um, declines. And, and we see that what started as a liquidity crisis can become a solvency crisis, right? And, and this, of course, creates strong fragility of these systems. The paradox is that um, when we entered the monetary union, we were told that because we are together in a club, in the union, we will be stronger. The facts are is that by becoming members of this union, each of us became more fragile, more slaves of the financial markets, because 
financial markets now in a monetary union have the power to force a default on a government. They don't have the power to force a default on standalone countries because a standalone country is always stronger than the markets. They have a central bank that will produce all the liquidity of the world that is necessary to pay out the bondholders. And as a result, we have a regime change here. And, and it, this also explains the kind of macroeconomic policies that have been imposed on the Eurozone, panic in, in financial market that forces governments into excessive austerity that in the end, instead of improving the capacity to service the debt, makes the capacity to service the debt weaker. And this, I think, has been the story of, whoops, sorry, Ireland, Portugal, and Spain. I would have a different story about Greece. I think Greece was insolvent, but we didn't know, right? Um, so there, I, there, there you have to solve it differently. That is to restructure the debt and, and recognize that uh, um, the, the, the claims we have on, on Greece should be uh, abandoned or at least uh, deep haircuts should be um, allowed. But um, so the, for the other countries, I do think that um, the, 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 this, this is a key problem. And, and, and so we, we get here two interconnected um, issues, stabilizers that existed that have been that have unraveled, right? Prior to the Eurozone, each of these countries that had the lender of last resort that was willing to provide liquidity in times of crisis. This has been abolished at, in the Eurozone. And as a result of that, the automatic stabilizers in the budget have also been disconnected. Because once you get into a crisis, which is typically in a recession, you have to increase taxes, you have to reduce spending. In other words, make the budget pro-cyclical, while in, in well-behaved countries that have a liquidity backstop, you have the capacity for the budget to do its work of automatic stabilizer. Not indefinitely, of course, but surely you have a possibility to do so. So we, have, we eliminated important stabilizers that we had built up over the years, right, over the the, the, the decades right, to make capitalism more stable with lenders of last resort, also in the government bond markets, not only for banks, but also in the government bond markets, and a capacity of budgets to do some stabilizing. All this was de facto abolished in the US, of creating uh, the kind of crisis that we have seen. Okay? So, yeah, let me uh, skip a few things because of time constraints, but these were, maybe I show it. Yeah, let me show you. This is a recent piece that I did uh, for Fox where I show um, austerity, measures of austerity on the horizontal axis that were implemented in 2011 and the subsequent GDP growth, right? And you can see that, not surprisingly, countries that introduced the steepest austerity measures also experienced. Um, the, the strongest decline of GDP. Ireland is a little bit above that line. Right? Uh, did a lot of austerity, but somehow managed to avoid the kind of recessions that other countries that did similar austerity uh, went, went through. And, and then, of course, the, 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 uh, the other part of, of this story is that, uh, again, when you put austerity measures on the horizontal axis, the same austerity measures that I showed you, those austerity measures that were implemented in 2011, and the subsequent increases in the debt-to-GDP ratio, and then you find a positive line. That is, the more you did austerity, the worse became your debt-to-GDP ratio. So this is subsequent, right, to avoid possible um, causality in two, two directions. Right? Um, so that il illustrating the point that I'm making, that I've been making um, before. Okay, let me, yeah, so let me summarize this. So the, the Eurozone was left unprepared to deal with endemic booms and busts in capitalism. They are there. They will always be there. We should have no illusions, right, that somehow we will avoid booms and busts, bubbles and crashes. They will come again, right? And, um, but we, left, we are totally unprepared. And probably the Monetary Union might have exacerbating this. And, and nothing was in place to stabilize an unstable system that pushed some countries into bad equilibria. Right? Ireland was pushed into a bad equilibrium. So was Spain, etc. Um, and others in good equilibria. Germany was pushed in a gentle 
good equilibrium, right? All the money of the West arrived in Germany and they could do nice things about it. For example, keep their banks afloat costlessly, almost costlessly, right? Because they could borrow at almost zero interest rates. So it's easy to solve a banking problem. Germany also had a banking problem, but could easily deal with it when the money is almost for free, right? Um, and, and so that, that created a huge uh, antagonism also between these countries. Because now we feel how the, the political tension that, that arises when some have it good and others have it bad in the same crisis. How do we design the Eurozone? That's the second part. How much time do I have left over? Just not to... hmm? Okay, fine, perfect, yeah. How do we design? Um, I, I'm going to talk about three levels at which uh, one should work, right? Uh, one has to do with the role of the European Central Bank. That it will already be obvious what I want to say there, right? Given the nature of the analysis that I've been making. The other has to do with the, what I call the medium run here, the macroeconomic policies in the Eurozone. What's the nature of macroeconomic policies? How should they be designed, huh? especially now in a crisis situation? And then the long run, that's when I will start dreaming about uh, budgetary union, fiscal union, political union, right? Uh, they, they are important, but they are far, far out in the future there, okay? So let me start with the role of the ECB. I think um, here, what we certainly need to do is to reinstitute a central bank at the level of the Eurozone, because there's only one central bank in the Eurozone that is willing to be the backstop, the lender of last resort, not only for the banks, but also for governments in the, in the government bond markets. Right? Uh, I think that is key. That has been the great invention in stabilizing capitalism, the fact that the central bank is ready there to provide liquidity to solvent but illiquid banks and to solvent but illiquid governments because banks and governments have the same problem. Right? Runs on banks exist, runs on governments also. And as a result, a central bank has to do its work there. Uh, it has taken some time for the ECB to recognize this, but as you know, last year, the ECB finally acted and announced its willingness to buy un unlimited amounts of government bonds. That's the key, right? Unlimited. Uh, prior to that, it had an SMP program, a program of buying government bonds, but this was announced to be limited in size and in time, and that's the worst thing you can do. Right? If you say, I'm going to buy government bonds, but it's going to be limited, the amount that I'm buying, and limited in time, you give a signal to all these bondholders to sell when? Now. In, if you, if, if, if you were, um, in fact, planning to sell later, the announcement then meant that all these bondholders said, now is the time to sell because they will stop soon buying, so it's the time to do it. So this was incredibly stupid. Um, so now they have found out. Usually you find out stupidity afterwards. Um, but it's also the same holds for me. Huh? I'm not saying that uh, uh, it's only the ECB that uh, does these things. So, but now they, they have announced um, this outright monetary transaction program, OMT, that has this intention to be a backstop in times of crisis, right? And, and in fact, in defending OMT, um, Draghi used the same kind of analysis that I've been using, that is that the euro area, large parts of the euro area are in a bad equilibrium, in which you may have self-fulfilling expectations that feed on themselves, right? And you have to stop this. And the central bank has the capacity to stop this. Um, and this has said, in fact, spectacular effects on, on the spreads. Since uh, the, the announcement, the spreads have gone down dramatically, and the higher the spreads were, the, the, the stronger the decline was, right? Uh, the, therefore, the Greek decline in the spreads was the, the most pronounced, and, 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 and so forth. So I think this was the right step. The ECB, in, in, in fact, saved the Eurozone, but uh, I still feel a little bit uh, um, uncomfortable because too, too many conditions have been attached to this. Uh, the ECB has announced that, well, you should go into uh, some austerity if you want to have liquidity and, 
I personally feel that austerity has been um, too intense. But anyway, it, I think it's important. Um, yeah, I'm going to skip a few things. There's been a lot of criticism of this program. I'm not going to go into that. Maybe during the question time, you may want to raise these issues. What about inflation risk? What about the moral hazard uh, risk of all this? And what about fiscal implications? But I will skip that so that if you want to come back to that, so I, I'm just going to skip quite a lot of, uh, of these slides here. If you want to come back to this, uh, I, I will be happy to, to do so. Now I come to, to my second um, dimension. Right? I talked about the role of the ECB. What kind of central bank do we need in a monetary union? Right? Now I come to the, the nature of macroeconomic policies. How, how should they be designed today? Right? And, and here my fundamental point is that um, countries, the way it has been dealt with is very asymmetric. And, and we should move towards a symmetric adjustment mechanism. Here is the nature of the asymmetry. I show you the relative unit labor costs um, in, in the number of countries that, that have been um, experiencing financial difficulties. Right? Prior to the crisis, you can see how these relative unit labor costs in all these countries increased. So the relative unit labor cost is the unit labor cost of a particular country divided by the average unit labor cost of the other countries. Right? So that it's a measure of competitiveness. If that line goes up, it means that unit labor costs increase faster than in the rest of the Eurozone. And here you see Ireland, right, with a very substantial loss of competitiveness prior to the crisis. And since then, uh, a quite a significant adjustment, right? Um, and, and you see the same pattern, or a similar pattern, in most of the other countries, although not as strong as in Ireland. Uh, here is Greece, also significant adjustment. Here, economists call this decline here internal devaluations. You lower wages and prices so as to restore your competitiveness. I don't have to explain you that here in this country. I also don't have to explain you how painful that is and how that initially turns into a recession. And the, the positive effects that you may hope for, competitiveness improvements, take more time to, to work through, right? And, and uh, especially if everybody is doing this at the same time. And that, that's the difference, for example, between what is happening in the Eurozone and what has happened with one Baltic state that also does an internal devaluation, but being a small country and doing it more or less alone creates then a much more potent positive effect of improvement of competitiveness relative to the negative effect of a reduction of purchasing power of, of people. Right? So this has been a very painful process in all these countries. One might have hoped that the other countries, these are the debtor countries, the creditor countries would have done the opposite. Did they? And the answer is no. Nothing, or almost nothing happened there. So we have an asymmetric adjustment system where the creditor countries, sorry, where, where the debtor countries are forced to do all the adjustment. There are imbalances in the system, current account deficits of some, current account surpluses of others, and it is the deficit countries that have to do all the adjustment, while the surplus countries do very little. And that creates a deflationary bias, right? Uh, and and, and is in my view, also the reason why we have turned into a double dip recession. So this is the growth of GDP in the Eurozone, and you can see the, the big, um, but relatively short recession in the period 2008-2009. Then there was a recovery, and we turned back into a recession. Um, last year, essentially. And, and the question is, will we turn, get out of this? But my point is that we got into that double dip recession precisely because the macroeconomic adjustment was asymmetric and created a deflationary bias. If only the deficit countries, the debtor countries, have to do the adjustment by reducing spending relative to output, while the others don't do the opposite, that is increasing spending, relative to output, since they have a current account surplus, then the whole system turns into a deflationary machinery. So towards um, more symmetry, how to do it? Well, clearly the, the, the debtor countries somehow are condemned to go on with some form of austerity, but I would argue 
spread over a longer period, but this must be compensated by a willingness of the creditor countries to do the opposite. You have to reduce spending relative to output. The creditor nations should increase spending relative to output, and, and they have the means to do so. Um, here I show you the debt to GDP ratios in the creditor countries, um, and you can see that with the exception of France, all these countries have stabilized their debt to GDP ratios. So my rule would be just go on stabilizing your debt to GDP ratio. That is, you can have some deficit, right? especially for Germany, it's important. Right? Germany is the major country among the creditor nations. Germany now tries to and has achieved a balanced budget. That is, it's now pushing the debt to GDP ratio downwards. I'm saying stop this. Right? Take as a rule to maintain the debt to GDP ratio fixed. And that allows you then to have a budget deficit of about 2 to 3 percent because the, the, the denominator in the debt to GDP ratio, GDP, is increasing at a nominal rate of 2 to 3 percent. And um, that allows your deficit also to be around 2 to 3 percent, right? Uh, you add some debt while your GDP grows nominally. But that is not what Germany wants to do today. Today they want to go to balanced budget, like in the 1930s. Right? in the midst of a recession, balance the budget. So that should be the rule. The, the, the debtor countries, of course, are on a very different path, an explosive path of debt to GDP ratio. I, I was told during lunch that it's going to stabilize here. Is that right? Around 123 or 4 or something, right? Uh, so most of, of the debtor countries an explosive path. Italy is not really. They have no, not much choice, but they should count on the others' willingness to stimulate their economy so as to make it easier to stabilize their own debt to GDP ratios. Okay, so that's what I've. Um, and then let me conclude by saying a few things, but very short, but we can come back to that at a later stage if you like. Uh, in the long run, economists have recognized right from the start, and, and uh, we, we talked during the lunch also of the, about the McDougall report, right, uh, which was produced in the 1970s, uh, which was uh, a view about future monetary union, and the key element or the key proposal there was that if we do a monetary union, we should also have some form of fiscal union. Right? Um, we have completely disregarded this when we created the monetary union. Um, the dis those who designed the monetary union said, we don't need a fiscal union. This turn turns out to be wrong, right? We, we now know it's completely wrong. Um, so ideally, we, we, would, we will have to go to a full fiscal union. But what is a full fiscal union? Take the example of the United States. That would be like a, a federal nation um, but but with, with the union, fiscal union, and that's 25% of GDP. Um, so the, the budget, the EU budget is 1% of GDP. And a discussion in Brussels to raise it from 1 to 1.1 leads to terrible conflicts. Right? So it's clear that in the foreseeable future we will not go there. Maybe in 100 years, who knows? But but not in our lifetimes, okay? So that seems to me to be something we have to take into account. So the question is, what can be done? Can, sh should we despair and say, well, it's lost? Some people say that, yes. I would say, no, we, 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 we can do a number of things that uh, also have a signaling function, right? Uh, we, we, we all know that this full fiscal union is too far, but we, by doing a number of things, we can, signal that we really want to go in that direction, right? That's the direction of a fiscal union. Well, let's start moving in that direction and not in another one, right? That's, a, that's key to, to uh, maintain confidence in the future of, of that monetary union, right? And, and what do we have to do? Um, here are some 
things that have been floating around, I'm not inventing anything here, I do believe that partial pooling of debt is part of this, right? Where we issue euro bonds um, in, in a limited way, right? Uh, we, we take enough care for moral hazard issues that arise there, there have been several proposals to do that, right? Um, but that again is a signal, there's a signaling function, right? If you start doing it, it's like tying your hands and, and making it clear, yes, we are, we, we want to stay together, right? That's, that's what you want to do. The banking union is another important uh, element in, in all this, um, and we have moved forward. So I, we have done a number of things. And banking union is the, uh, has different um, components. One is the common supervision, and that seems to be an, uh, accepted. And the other one is a common deposit guarantee system and a common resolution mechanism. These are the weak points, especially the common resolution, because that also implies some type of fiscal union. When you have to resolve a banking crisis at a European level, then you need to pool resources to do so, and some institution must be able to garner these resources quickly. Right? In times of crisis, you, you really need a powerful institution that is capable of doing the trick of resolving banking crisis, and that can only be if that is an institution that has some capacity to raise taxes, or that can, through rules that are credible, obtain tax revenue from the participating countries. These are key, um, key elements that we have to introduce, but as you know, this is now very much um, contested, especially in Germany, and, and therefore it's unclear whether we will move um, towards a, a, um, a banking union soon. All this requires transfer of sovereignty. We shouldn't have no illusions. Um, Transfer of sovereignty is key in this whole process, right? Uh, and, and as a result, we can also say that political union must remain and will remain the necessary condition to make this whole project sustainable in the long run. So to, one way to put this, the euro is a currency without a country, so we have the choice. Either we create a country at the European level, and then we can keep the euro, or if we don't want to create a country at the European level, we should say goodbye to the Euro. Thank you for your attention.